For Krima Media's Polity, I'm Sane Lamini. Joining me today is former UCT Vice Chancellor Dr. Max Price to discuss his book titled Statues and Storms Leading Through Change. So, Dr. Price, after years of being an academic in the medical field, as well as being an anti-apartheid activist, you found yourself as a man in the arena during the University of Cape Town Rose Must Fall protest, often a target of protest. What are your reflections on this experience? The experience of being Vice-Chancellor of the University of Cape Town was 10 years and that's actually the maximum that one can be a vice chancellor it's always a five-year term you can have it renewed once so i did the full 10 years and when i started writing the book it was meant to be a reflection on that period because uh, seven of the years the first seven years from 2008 until 2015 were years of a complete high i would say it was a just uh, riding the crest of the wave the university was doing very well and, and is still, but was doing very well and we had tremendous progress at recruiting top students, top academics, research output. And then the last year after the protest, the protests were two to two and a half years from 2015 <coughs> until 2017. And the last year was again a year when the, when the experience was a wonderful experience. So when I reflect on the period of 10 years, uh, eight of those years were really wonderful, thrilling years, and um, I would certainly do it again. It was, it was a wonderful period. The book was meant to be about the 10 years, but it ended up being far too long. And the editors basically said, firstly, it needs to be shorter. People won't read a long book. And secondly, um, the, main, the most interesting part for most people will be the protest period, which was the Roads Must Fall and Fees Must Fall protests starting in early 2015 and running up until about the end of 2017. And um, when I reflect on that, I also feel that I was, and this was the reference to the man in the arena, when history is being made, as I think history was being made during that period, the whole landscape of higher education in South Africa changed as a result, and especially at the liberal, historically English-speaking universities, when history is being made, I want to be not a bystander watching the history being made, but an actor. This quote from, from Roosevelt says, the man in the arena helping shape that history. And though it was very stressful, and uh, stre tremendously stressful on me and on my family, um, I am glad that I was able to play a part in steering the institution through the storms that we experienced giving some guidance and ultimately getting it back to the safe harbor after the storms. That's, that's the reference in the book to statues and storms. It feels to me like those were a very, it was a very turbulent, stormy period. And my role as the sort of captain of the ship with a crew was to get it back on even keel, safe place. The road must fall called for decolonization of UCT and for improved conditions for black students and academics. What is your view as uh, to the state of transformation of UCT and other historically white South African universities? Well, the situation, of course, w was very different for the historically black universities. So we have 23 public universities in the country. The uh, historically black universities, which is about half of those universities, and the universities of technology, most of which were largely black universities, um, or became, uh, obviously faced very different decolonization issues. Because they, although they had similar curricula, and although they had a similar origin in their idea of what a university should be, uh, because they were dominated, by, by, dominated in, the, in the sense of numbers by black students and staff, um, black students did not feel that the culture of the institution was alienating. They didn't feel like they didn't belong there. That was really a feature of the historically white universities. As they opened up, more and more black students came, but black students still felt that they were in a strange, in a foreign place, in a place that didn't belong to them. So when we talk about decolonization, it has many different elements. 
and one of the elements is the institutional culture and that was the main thing that we were trying to address through Roads Must Fall, particularly through Roads Must Fall. Um, and the institutional culture also has many dimensions. So the Rhodes statue was a good symbol that captured that culture because he represented the colonial empire. But he was also a symbol because he was a prominent statue on the campus, which was an offense to people who had been colonized by white settlers or had actually been massacred in the case of Zimbabweans or had been exploited in the case of poor mine workers and to continue to hold him up as an icon of the institution was, was really problematic. But he was just one. There were many buildings that had names of the leaders of the past, usually white male leaders, and black students said we don't see ourselves in any of these buildings or any of the icons that are being presented. The artworks was another, and the photographs and the portraits on the walls of the, of the campus. The language, the attitude to accent, and the attitude to how people responded if you spoke English like I do with a certain accent or if you came from townships or rural areas. Um, the social relations between uh, lecturers and professors and students, which was often different between black students and white students, not because there was racism, but because of familiarity. And that resulted in a perception of favoritism, that white lecturers were engaged more easily and were more well disposed to white students than to black students. All of these are aspects of the culture. And I think that that has substantially changed as a result of Rhodes Must Fall on most of historically white campuses and in fact around the world. The movement that was started by Rhodes Must Fall led to the removal and the contestation of statues in Europe, in Britain, in America, in Canada. It led to the changing of names of buildings and of schools because in America too, black African American students on, on American campuses were being confronted by the statues of slave owners or the names of slave owners who had made a lot of money out of slavery and then had endowed money to the law school of Harvard or to the um, residence of Princeton or, or, or and, and so they carried the names of the slave owners and often their emblems and African American students said similarly to in South Africa this is just uh, not on, this, this is what alienates us, this is why uh, white culture is valorized, is made to be important in black culture is, is demeaned. Um, so that's just the one part, the culture. But decolonization is more than the institutional culture and it's also about the curricula. And so that was a separate but parallel battle that, we're, that, that is still ongoing. So while I think the cultural issues have been largely dealt with, the curriculum issues are still being debated and, and worked through. And it's, there aren't any easy answers. They have to be worked through by the community of academics. Can you also now tell our viewers how you approached your interactions uh, with uh, Kumani Makwele and other student leaders uh, of the Roads Must Fall movement? Just to remind your readers that uh, Kumani Makwele was uh, the student who threw poo on the statue, uh, which was the start of Roads Must Fall. Um, and my relationship with him was uh, a sort of a bit of a love-hate relationship, as I describe in the book. Uh, it was actually because of me that he came to UCT. He was uh, a student who was arrested four years before all of this happened with Rhodes Must Fall for giving a finger to the president's blue light cavalcade. And I wanted to find out who he was, so I approached him, asked him to come see me, discovered that he wanted to study politics, but he wasn't able to get into the university, didn't have money, and so I arranged uh, financial assistance and uh, that he could study. So in some ways, certainly at, in the beginning, we had quite a positive relationship. And he also recognized in his initial speeches that the proposal, in a way, that the road statue might come down had come from me uh, a year before his protest. So he thought he was sort of, uh, it was a protest that he expected would, would, would fall on fertile ground. Um, but um, it did change because for, for various reasons and uh, 
he did a number of things uh, which were absolutely unacceptable. Uh, which, so although I, although I declined to, to discipline him for the poo throwing, which many people thought I should do, but we decided not to because uh, we thought that he had triggered a really important movement and that it did lead to the statue coming down and the statue would probably not have come down if he hadn't done that. And so to punish him was probably a mixed message, it wasn't appropriate. On the other hand, there were other things he did which we did punish him for, and needed to, and he was expelled from the university at one point. So, um, and of course he was very angry with me and the other, P and the other executive members about that. So, um, as I say, a bit of a, a love-hate relationship there. But with the student leaders more generally, it was very complex. Um, and part of the reason was that the roads must fall, and especially the fees must fall movements, they styled themselves on the Occupy movements. People will remember that in the shortly after 2010, there was a movement called Occupy Wall Street. And then there were similar Occupy movements all around the world, which occupied buildings, occupied spaces. The thing about these Occupy movements was that they were very flat structures with no official leaders, with no official spokespersons, and with no constitution that would help them decide who should be part of this movement and who shouldn't. Anyone who identified could be part of it. And what we found when we were negotiating with the student leaders, unlike the SRCs where there's an election and the leaders are identifiable and they have a formal mandate from the student body, in the fallist movements, as we call them, the students would often report to a plenary, which would be a meeting in the evening of hundreds of students, hundreds of protesters, they would say what they were negotiating, and if the plenary didn't agree with them, they would change them, and they would send a different group of people the next day. And for us, as the management negotiating with them, this made it extremely difficult, because you, you, you thought you'd made some progress, and then the goalpost would be moved, and, and you couldn't offer, sometimes you couldn't develop really a relationship of trust with people because it was moving. And many people thought, well, we just shouldn't negotiate with them. You can't negotiate with this sort of changing leadership that doesn't have a mandate, that doesn't really have legitimacy, that doesn't have a constitution, that can't be recalled, and that is constantly changing the goalposts. But our view was that when you have a body of people that have some power, and they did have power because they had the numbers of perhaps 2,000, 3,000 at any time, they would organize uh, groups in bands where they would go into lecture theatres all over the campus. At UCT it's very hard to close off the campus because there's no fence around the campus, there's no gate to the campus. So people can roam in with their satchels and their books, they look like regular students, and they are regular students, they'll go into a lecture theatre. Once there's ten of them in the lecture theatre and the lecture starts, then they'll start jumping on the desk, toy toying, telling everyone they have to leave, the lecture can't continue, you can't really bring security, you can try to get security, but if it's happening in 20 or 30 lecture theatres at the same time, by the time you try to control it, the lecture is finished. So they had real power. Uh, they had the ability to prevent the university from going about its normal business. And they could do that on quite a big scale because there were, uh, between at times there may have been two, three hundred, even that's a lot, but at times there were several thousand. So for the management team to say, well, we're not going to negotiate, doesn't actually get you anywhere. It just means that the university is shut mm -hmm. and you don't make any progress. We felt that we needed to negotiate. And one of the strategies we adopted, you're asking how did we relate to them, was we allowed them to live stream the negotiations themselves, which is highly unusual, never, never seen that done before, so that they would have their, video, their phones with videos on and they would be broadcasting on Facebook or on, on other social media to any students who were interested, including the plenary students, so that the plenary students could firstly see that these representatives of them, so-called representatives, were not being co-opted by the management team, which is what they often accused uh, them of, that they could understand some of the debates themselves, they could see where we were compromising, where we were uh, accepting that there was an, a problem that needed to be fixed and where we weren't accepting, and they could get a sense of whether we were just the enemy or whether we were negotiating in good faith to try to make progress. 
And I think that that was ultimately effective. And they could also see the student leaders, the Fallist movement was an umbrella movement for many different groups of students who felt alienated or othered for one or other reason. So one of the strategies for dealing with this amorphous group with many different demands, uh, but all related to feeling that they weren't being heard and weren't being, their problems weren't being addressed, was to address them one by one. And as those subgroups saw that their issues were being addressed, they would separate off and they would um, stop supporting the disruptions and the shutdowns until eventually we were left with a very small group of students. So even, for example, the fees must fall students, when they could see that there was actually nothing the university could do more because the, it was about government budgets, mm -hmm. and they could see that we were genuinely trying to help students in need, but that we couldn't solve all the problems, and that there was no further purpose in shutting down the university. So little by little, over a period of many weeks, the different student groups would separate themselves, would stop supporting the core group, until eventually we had a small core group that had their own agenda, often it was a party political agenda from outside EFF, PAC, ANC factions that were using the campus as a place to fight out the broader political battles. And, and that group was ultimately small enough for us to say, we can now control this. We can bring in security, we can ensure that we can run the exams. And that group could see that they didn't have support anymore and they then signed an agreement that said they wouldn't disrupt the exams or the lectures anymore. So it's a long answer to the question of how do we deal with student leadership, but the, I hope the context helps explain a bit about what our strategies were. Are you able to share with our viewers if you received a, any criticism for your decision to remove the statue of Cecil John Rhodes for the UCT campus and where is the statue now? Well, the last, the second question is easy to answer. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> it's in, it's, it's in storage. It's in the country. It's in storage. It's in Cape Town, and I hope that when the time is right, it will make its appearance, probably in a museum or a gallery or in some space, which will allow us to use it as an educational tool to remind people that we don't want to erase that history. We don't want to pretend it didn't happen. Rhodes was, Rhodes affected everyone, white, black, and it's part of our history and we need to understand it. But it's not uh, on the campus. On the first question, I mean, I received criticism, we received criticism for almost everything we did. There was the, the whole point about the controversies that you could not please even half the people, half the, you know, most of the time. Everyone has their own view and often very strongly held views, whether it was about dealing with artworks, renaming buildings, even the issues of curriculum. Uh, all of these are very controversial issues and people criticized us left, right and center. On the statue, specifically, we went through a one-month consultation process before agreeing to take it down or before the council of the university made its decision ultimately. And in that consultation process, I think people changed their minds as a result of hearing the debates. So when we started off, I'm, I, I feel fairly sure that the vast majority were against taking the statue down. And I'm talking about the majority of students, of staff, of academics, of alumni, of donors, but even of government. So the president uh, and many ministers told us you must not take down the statue because there had been a general policy of reconciliation that said we're going to respect the different heritages in the country, that reconciliation requires recognizing those histories and moving forward, not trying to give priority to some people's history and diminish other people's history. And you know, some of the evidence of that is the statue of the man on the horse in front of parliament, which is still there. It's controversial. Some people think it should be taken down. But, it, you know, it, it is there and many other statues are around still. So we were criticized a lot. But through that period of the month of debating, people came increasingly around to the view that the statue should go. And in the Senate meeting, which is all the senior academics of the university, there were only a handful, very few votes against it. 
and like 95, 98% of the Senate members supported removing it. In the council meeting, which is the governance structure, um, they were also almost unanimous that the statue should go. The only group that remained very critical, I would say the majority never agreed with the alumni. And one must remember that the alumni, firstly, are people who are all over the world. There's about 100,000 alumni. A third of them are outside South Africa. So that the first point is that they don't, they're not as familiar with the issues and they don't feel the pressures and the tensions as we do in the country. Secondly, many of them, by definition, are much older. Alumni, they're an older generation, they are more conservative. And thirdly, they feel very attached, nostalgic, about the campus as it was when they were students and the presence of the Rhodes statue when they were students. And so most of them were not persuaded. Although I would be interested today to find out because what started off as a movement just on the UST campus, as I mentioned to you, has become a worldwide movement. And many of them live in countries now where statues have come down and they probably understand that this wasn't some sort of heresy at UCT capitulating to a mob, that this was an idea whose time had come globally that needed to be rethought, you know, part of Black Lives Matter movement, part of the anti-slave or recognition of the legacy of slavery movement. And I, I, I would think many of them would now understand it better. Dr. Price, you also mentioned in the book that uh, during the protest you didn't consult uh, with the academic staff um, who began to feel uh, neglected and confused uh, as the protest continued. What did you learn from that, especially after receiving an open letter from Professor Kevin Naidu? So I do want to differentiate between the, the debates around the statue which I think were very widely consulted, including the academics, and the academics actually voted on that, um, which was a different set of protests from the fees must fall protests. Those came 10 months later, and they were more violent, uh, particularly in 2016, and they were national. The roads must fall really happened at UCT. The fees must fall was a national protest so that it wasn't something where you could just act with one campus. Just to clarify that, and, I, and you're quite right that, as I described before, this constant negotiating with different groups of student leaders who had the power, I think we failed to keep the uh, university community, the non-student community, the academics especially, up to date with what we were doing. We thought that they would know, in part because we were live streaming, and if they really wanted to see, they could go and live stream, they could look at the live streaming. And our communication was also uh, hampered in a way because we felt that sometimes if we were negotiating about shifting a position, we needed to test that with, our, with the negotiating partners, the student leaders, before going public with a view. But whatever uh, Professor Naidu's letter, and it was supported by many other people, um, highlighted for us that we had failed to communicate adequately with the staff body and with probably some of the students and we needed to do that better. Now one of the lessons that we learned was that we were relying on a traditional way of communicating and what that entailed was press conferences and releasing letters or communications in writing or an email to the staff. And we were very careful, someone would draft the statement, it would go through some editing, it would come to me to say, am I willing to sign off on it because it's going out in my name? I might be busy in negotiations or with something else or running the university and it may take me 12 hours before I have time to read it, look at it, sign off on it. And often a communication would take 24 hours before it got out. Meanwhile, the students were issuing communications on Facebook in real time. And when people want to know what's happening now, is the university going to reopen tomorrow? Are the buses running? Uh, is the library open? They would end up going to the student media, social media, which was much quicker. And the lesson was that we had not developed our skills and our capacity to communicate with social media in real time. We had to lighten up and, and, and not be so controlling about 
the actual wording of the press statements, signing off on it in the same way. We needed to develop a whole different technique. I don't think we ever got, quite got it right. And it's one of the th things I say, university managements and com corporate managements and government managements need to recognize that just as the Arab Spring in 2010 highlighted how protests can be organized, people can be mobilized, communications happen through the use of Twitter and social media, and, and, and the establishment was not ready to deal with that. So I think we still aren't ready to deal with that, and we need to develop that capacity before the protests erupt, not react to it when, they, when they've erupted. The UCT is a leading university in Africa. Can you tell us about the challenges and the changes that you had to embark on to accommodate uh, black students who came from disadvantaged backgrounds? This is something that UCT and WITS and others have been doing now for two or three decades. It's not such a new thing. What, what's probably changed is the numbers. When, when we had only 5 or 10% of our student body coming from disadvantaged schools or disadvantaged backgrounds, you could address that by targeting interventions to those groups. For example, you might have a special class in a course in, in computer skills or in English and, and writing skills or in mathematics, um, which would be aimed at a small group and you could give them extra tutorials if a student came in and you discovered that they just, although they'd done well enough to get in, that actually their writing skills were not good enough to write an essay and they needed help, you could give them an extra tutor or you could say to them, take your course over a longer period. And what changed around 2010 onwards and over this protest period, what changed was that the numbers became so big that you weren't just tackling the problem for a small number of people where you could give someone an extra tutor. You ha it, it was now 50% of the class that were in that situation. So you had to redesign to some a significant extent the curricula, especially the first, the early year curricula, so that they recognized that the educational uh, challenges that people were coming in or the skills they were bringing in, the level of their school education actually applied to a sig uh, 50, 60, 70 percent perhaps of a class and so the whole class had to be done differently. Um, and so as we put it in our, in our strategic plan, instead of simply expecting individual students to adapt to the culture or to adapt to catch up and to fit in with, without having to change the main stream of the university approach, we needed to change that and recognize that the university needed to change its approach for everyone in order to adapt to that. And lastly, now we are talking to you in uh, 2023 and unfortunately our country is still struggling to get it right with the education standards. We've seen statistics which have revealed that 81% um, of our grade 4 pupils can't read for meaning. What do you think should be done uh, to improve the education system in our country? Look, I don't want to present myself as an expert on the school system. I'm not. But I agree with you that we've, um, we do have better access. More people are in school than was the case in 1994. But the quality is very poor. Um, and uh, it is about a, a range of interventions. Resources, firstly, and the resources, in my opinion, should be going into early childhood development, ECD. That's obviously the starting point for kids to cope at school. Um, secondly, in the schools, the fact that we have mud schools still, the fact that we have schools without toilets and with pit latrines, and that we have classrooms with 60 or more children in a class with one teacher, um, is, 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 is largely about resources and manage, managers of the provincial authorities not paying attention to the, the, the details. It's about corruption um, and so I think that the starting point is to fix the management of the, edu of the school education systems at provincial levels. Um, because if you don't have decent managers, you can put more money into it, it's not going to go to the right places. I also think that um, to, to a significant extent the, the unions, um, and particularly SAD2, has, has been 
a negative influence. There's always not universally negative. There are some positive things, but they, ha they have uh, attempted to control often the appointments in schools, um, and as have as have other structures that are in the communities that insist that the jobs to teachers should go to their members of those communities, teachers who come from those communities, often not properly qualified or not good enough. And the best teachers, the teachers who are really good, don't get promoted into principalships or into senior jobs. And that has often been the result of community interference and union interference in the management of the school. So I think there has to be a much harder line taken that merit and quality of education, quality of teachers um, is the most important thing. And they have to be rewarded, but they need to be rewarded, those teachers, not just for, not just by being promoted. There needs to be a different reward system so that a really good maths teacher or English teacher can improve her salary without having to leave the school and become an inspector or become a principal or become someone who works in head office. Um, we need to have a remuneration system that rewards her for having better results in her classroom and rewarding them for that as well. There needs to be more security at schools. I mean, in, in, I'm, I'm from Western Cape and the gangs and, 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 and private, uh, the problems of security in schools is destroying the schools as well. And there's just, unfortunately, so many problems um, that I'm not the first to identify these and you know, they're in some ways well known. But I think it starts with management and with um, appointing people who are the best people, not cadre deployment, not um, people who are the friends, not nepotism in the unions or elsewhere. That was former UCT Vice Chancellor speaking to Krima Media's Polity, discussing his book titled Statues and Storms Leading Through Change.